We are live in Seattle with the interview of the day of the morning. Howard Schultz is here announcing yesterday that he's going to step down from the company as executive chair after nearly 40 years. Of course, growing this company from just 11 stores in, here in Seattle to now 28,000 in over 77 different countries. Uh, talked about the future, um, potentially some philanthropy, and of course, a lot of speculation about a comment you made about public service, which we're going to talk about as well. Uh, thank you for being here, first of all. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the last time we were together here, Kevin Johnson was sitting next to you. Yes. You uh, were handing over the reins of the company as the CEO, mm -hmm. but you said, I'm all in. I'm all in for Starbucks. So here we are a year later. Why now? Well, wh whether I leave Starbucks or not, I will always be all in at Starbucks. But this has been planned for over a year. And my confidence and faith in Kevin and the leadership team, the long-term opportunity for Starbucks, the company's in a great position. And it's always been a team sport. It's the right time for me to leave. And I have other opportunities and other things that I want to do. I want to talk about those other opportunities in a second. But just in terms of the timeline, yes. uh, you talked to the board about a year ago, but had planned, from what I understand, to step down in May well, the truth of the matter is, I thought this was going to happen in May, and then we had the unfortunate, reprehensible incident in Philadelphia, and we thought, given what we wanted to do in Philadelphia and the obligation we had, uh, we were going to push it back a month or two, so here we are. So you talked about the opportunity ahead. Yes. So wh wh why are you stepping down from Starbucks now? Well, I think it's the right time for me to step down. Uh, it's been planned, as I said. Uh, I know there's been speculation, so let's just deal with that right away about whether or not I would run for public office. And what I really believe is there's a lot of things I can do as a private citizen other than run for the presidency of the United States. And l let's just see what happens. I've got lots of things that I'm thinking about. I'm writing a book. It's only been 24 hours. Uh, but we've talked many times about how concerned I am about the country, our standing in the world. And I think there's many things I can do as a private citizen to advance the cause of the promise of the country. But a lot of people look at the timing. They say 2020, two years away. If you're going to do it, you got to, if, especially running a publicly traded company, you have to get away from the company. What do you plan to do in terms of thinking about running or public service, if you will, over the next 12 months? Well, I've been engaged in a number of, I think, very important issues that are facing the country and trying to advance the cause of the national conversation about such things as immigration, as an example. Let's just take that. Uh, I don't think we've got a very humane policy. Uh, I think we need border security. But there's, there's, there's a lot of non-truths. As an example, two-thirds of the undocumented people that we're talking about are people that have not crossed the border. These are people that are, are here because their visa has expired. That's one thing. We talk about trade. Um, we, we, we're in a trade battle here that I do not understand. Our problem is not China. Our problem is here in the U.S. We have a $21 trillion debt. We're paying $400 billion of interest. Uh, these are things that are unsustainable. We have a budget process that is broken. We got a, a, a situation with veterans in which we, we talk about taking care of veterans, but then the VA doesn't work. Uh, and we have a tax policy, as you know, that we've talked about a year ago when I was with you. Uh, which I was, you know, very disappointed at. The corporate America did not need a tax cut to 21 percent when we could have done so much more for the people of the country. Forty-five percent of the people in America don't have $400 in a bank for a crisis. So all of these things, I think, are concerns of mine. And as you know, I've, I've, I am living proof in many ways, uh, not, like your, not unlike your guest host of the American Dream. So I'm very sensitive to these issues of ensuring the fact that we do the kind of things that restore the promise of the country and our standing around the world. Okay, so that language, by the way, is of somebody who, no, could, no. who could be running. Let me ask you this. No. What, would, what would be the tipping point for you? What do you, what do you have to figure out about whether you want to pursue what you call public service? Well, that's kind of a leading question that assumes that I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking specifically right now. What I'm thinking about is what I can do to advance the cause of the country as a private citizen. I don't know what that's going to mean. And there's, there's lots of time. There's lots of speculation. I, I really, I honestly don't know. We talked about right. this yesterday. And let me ask you a different question that relates to that, though. People talk about the presidency, 2020. You use the phrase public service. Yes. And I want to see if there's a distinction here. Would you ever run for governor or senator? I, I can't be 
uh, nailed down today on a specific of what I m might or might not run for. I, you know, I want to think about this through the lens of what it means to be a great American citizen. I don't know what that means at this point. Um, but my concern for the country uh, and my concern for our standing in the world, the lack of dignity, the lack of respect, the vitriolic behavior coming from this administration, I think we can do much better. And I think the political class as a whole, not only this administration, has been reckless specifically with regard to $21 trillion in debt and not being as fiscally conservative as we need to be. And we are going to pay for this in terms of the next generation. And it's unfair. I want to get into the policy issues, but, but I, want to, I want to ask you about this, this idea of a CEO as president. Yes. Uh, this was sort of an unthinkable issue uh, or idea just a couple of years ago. Yeah. How much, I mean, you, and now you see the stories, whether it be Bob Iger, yeah. who, who said he wanted to consider doing this, Oprah's name gets bandied about, right. Jamie Dimon's name gets bandied about, Mark Cuban's name gets bandied about. Do you think that President Trump's presidency, his election, has changed the dynamic with which somebody like you could think about public service in a way that you couldn't before? Well, I th it's an interesting question because there, there is a bifurcation, and I, I want to say this respectfully and so that no one misunderstands what I'm about to say, but there is a bifurcation between when you say a CEO. Uh, I, I have run a public company for 26 years as a fiduciary. Uh, the current president ran a private company where, uh, from what I understand, there is, he was running a private company with, I don't know if there was a board, I don't know what responsibilities he had to other shareholders. Bob Iger has run a public company. So when you're talking about a CEO in terms of public office, there is a very big difference between someone who has run a global enterprise like myself, who has traveled to China probably more than any other CEO in the last 10 years, who understands those issues, versus someone who's run a private company with very little fiduciary responsibility to other shareholders. And I'm not saying that as good or bad, but there's a big difference. And so I think, yes, President Trump has given license to the fact that someone who's not a politician could potentially run for the presidency. Uh, whether or not that uh, has anything to do with me will re remains to be seen. Right. I, I want to read you. This is uh, Professor Douglas Brinkley in the New York Times today. He's a presidential historian at Rice yeah. University. He says, the history of business leaders in the White House has not been good. You basically have Herbert Hoover and Donald Trump. What do you make well, of that? Just the uh, idea also yeah. of having political experience. Yeah, well, I, I think the rules of engagement for running the United States of America in a global society is very different than comparing it to Hoover or the current president. And what I specifically mean by that is we have serious problems that we have to address. And I think the, the issues that we are facing in terms of the, the dysfunction and the polarization that exists within the government is really based on a systemic problem of ideology. And I think we need a very different view of how the government and how the country should be run. And it's been a long time, I think, a long time, since anyone uh, within government has really walked in the shoes of the American people and done the things that would demonstrate the humanity of what is the values of the country and the guiding principles of the promise of America. Let me ask you a different question. One of the things you said is you're going to be writing a book about social responsibility, the new role of CEO leadership. Yeah, the role and responsibility of a public company in an ever-changing society. Well, let me, specifically about that, you, you really were the early champion of this idea of a moral leader and stepping out on public and social issues. It's something that's become a little bit more fashionable uh, in the last year and a half for some CEOs. But by the way, not without criticism um, and not without controversy in that it can put companies in a very difficult situation given the politics and division in this country. And I, I just want to comment to you, um, and Becky and I got to yeah. spend some time with Warren Buffett uh, over, the, over the weekend uh, about a month ago when he did his, his, his mm -hmm. annual meeting. And he's made the comment multiple times uh, that business shouldn't be in the business of politics. Well, I, I, I agree with Warren, uh, and I don't think Starbucks has been in the business of politics. I think that's been misconstrued. We have been in the business of creating a very different type of business model that balances our fiduciary responsibility to build shareholder value, which is up 21,000 percent since we went public in 92. So the price of admission has been met, coupled with a social impact agenda that speaks to equity in the form of stock options for our people, health insurance 20 years before the Affordable Care Act, free college tuition, 
and an engagement with 100 million customers a week about what we feel is our responsibility to raise a national conversation about things that we think are important. We think that is accretive to the equity of the brand and shareholder value. Others have criticized that, us for that, but I think it speaks to the fact, again, that the rules of engagement for a public company and a public CEO are different today, in large part because the government has been so dysfunctional and so polarized. I and mean, we haven't had a balanced budget since President Clinton. I mean, think about that. And we talk about immigration, I mean, just, right. just for a moment. Ronald Reagan in 1986 passed an immigration bill as a Republican president. So why can't we come together, move the ideology out, and do what's in the interest of American people? Seventy percent of the American people want a good immigration policy. Seventy percent of the American people want the kind of, of policy and legislation that takes the, the, uh, the guns of war out of the American people's neighborhoods. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. But the reason I'm, I'm pressing on this is when you think about the leader of a company, we have so many CEOs who are watching right now thinking about can they step out, should they step out on a particular issue, what it does and, and the jeopardy in certain instances yeah. it can put a company in. Well, but I, I think you, you, you just can't jump into the deep end of the pool overnight. You, you, you're, the culture and values of the company have to be skewed towards the, right, the fact that you have a license to talk about these things because they are embedded in your company. And as, as we talked yesterday, the litmus test for me has always been just one thing. Does this decision, this policy, going to make our customers and our people proud? And if the answer is yes, then we're on the right side of the debate. If it's not, then we shouldn't do it. But make no mistake, we're not in this to be political. We're in this to advance the cause of Starbucks. Uh, let me ask you one other question. It relates to policy. It relates to tax policy. Yes. We talked about it here. You've been critical of President Trump's approach, the Trump administration's approach to tax policy and the corporate tax uh, rate going yes. down. Um, and yet, uh, earlier this year, uh, you gave the administration credit for the fact that you were raising wages of employees at Starbucks. I'm not sure I gave the administration credit for that. What I said was, uh, and we were, we were together in your conference early on about yep. this. What I said very specifically is that I really did not believe that the majority of companies in America were going to take a corporate tax cut from, from 35 to 21 percent and do all the things that the administration was spewing about in terms of advancing the economy and creating jobs and doing all these great things. And I said most companies were going to give it back to the shareholders. And what we decided to do is that almost 50 percent of the benefit that we had, we gave to our people. I didn't give credit to the administration for that. I gave credit to the fact that the leadership of Starbucks did the right thing, and that is success is best when it's shared. And also, this is very important, that uh, when you're building a great, enduring company, not every business decision should be and is an economic one. And this is very important with regard to the street, who has a very short-term mentality. And, and as a CEO who has run a public company for 26 years, trying to communicate to the street, we're building a great, enduring company. And there will be times there will be cyclical changes, a downturn in comps, which we've had right. recently. But over the long term, we're going to be fine. How much credit, though, do you give to the Trump administration for the economy today? You look at the unemployment rate. You look at where the market is. Well, first off, I... I uh, I, I think it's very wrong to use the stock market as a proxy for the U.S. economy. Interest rates are going up, and if I had to make a bet, this, and I'm, I'm not an economist, I don't, I don't believe that the stock market is going to continue to grow at the level it has between now and 2020. You're going to see a, a, a sea change. So, uh, listen, uh, the economy is, is, is strong. I give President Obama credit for that. I give President Trump some credit for that. But you also have systemic problems in the country, the likes of which we have not had in a long time. You've got a major mental health crisis. You've got a major homeless crisis. You've got an opiate crisis. You have racial divide in the country. So, and you also have 45% of American households that don't have $400. And you have 67% of the workforce in America among men that are not in it. So there's lots of things that we have to do as a country to address the social issues. And I, going back to China and trade, just one more thing. Yeah. This, these, this, this rhetoric about this, all these trade wars that are now being engaged with China, with Mexico, with, with, with Canada, and, and this might sound like a trite line, but it's, it's important. We should not be in the business of building walls. We should be in the business of building bridges. 
with our neighbors, with our allies, and our standing in, our wor in, in the world today is not what it should be. And we have to advance America's values around the, around the world, and we have to deal with the systemic domestic issues in the country. And that is about servant leadership. We have not had servant leadership in government in a long time where we are working in service of the American people. I have a handful of questions about Starbucks, but hang on, because I know we have some questions back in New York. Guys? All right, great. Um, thanks, Andrew. And, and Howard, I, I, one of the highlights of your career, I don't know if you remember that award I gave you at, uh, at CNBC. Do you remember? I, you, you Somehow, I ended up learning what a 2% Vente no-foam iced latte with cinnamon, um, instead of just ordering a cup of coffee, I, I, I found myself saying that and ordering a Miles Davis CD and buying a scone, and my bill would come to $22. And I was like, I gave you kudos for that because you changed the world, basically. I don't know how you did it, but uh, I do, and I still order 2% Vente no foam lattes with cinnamon, which, uh, which is amazing. But um, I, I, my question is, when, when you left last time, something happened with the culture of Starbucks. I don't remember exactly what it was. The baristas changed, something changed, and, and the stock suffered. And then when you came back, it was, it's hard to believe that uh, that the person at the top can really change an entire company, but I think it happened. I'm just wondering, are you sure that's not going to happen again, especially when you're trying to navigate with this open policy of, of not having to buy anything? That seems like a tough thing to, li to leave on your predecessors, or uh, I'm sorry, on your successor's plate uh, at a time when I think that's going to have to be managed because it's going to be, you know, each, each store is going to have to figure out a way to manage through that. It's a tough time to leave. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Kevin Johnson and the team have been at my side now for a number of years. Uh, I feel very confident in the future leadership of the company. As I said to Andrew, there will always be some cyclical issues, but 2018 is not 2008 for Starbucks. Uh, we're building a great enduring company. We're opening a store in China every 15 hours. We're up to 3,500 stores. We have our new roastery opening in Italy and New York in September and October. Uh, the future of the company is very bright. Will there be cyclical changes? There will be at times, but I'm very confident in the long-term progress and value creation for Starbucks. How, by the way, uh, do you think investors should think about this company? By the way, on the announcement of your news, yeah. stock went down about 1%. But there's been questions about almost the hybrid nature of this company now. There's, there's the U.S. piece, yes. where same-sort sales are basically growing at 2% at the moment. Sure. Um, and then there's China, which is continuing yeah. to grow wildly. Yeah. Is this a value play? Is this a growth play? I mean, for so many years, this was a growth yeah. story. What is it now? I, I would bang the table and say we are a growth company that is experiencing a moment in time where U.S. comps have slowed. But U.S. comps have slowed in the U.S. before. And we will, without question, through innovation and disruption, uh, really, I think, do a number of things that will be catalytic over time to address the comp issue. But if you just isolate China and the growth of our international business, in many ways, the value of Starbucks is undervalued. So I'm very bullish long term on the company, and our U.S. comps over time will improve. I'm quite confident about that. Uh, Ken back in New York has got a question. Howard, Ken. How are you? Congratulations. We've been trying Ken. to get together for some hey, time. Ken. Let's make sure we do it now. Howard. Well, you, you, let me tell you, you, you have built a great company, and no, you I, are a great American story, so it's an honor to be with you. Well, my honor is to be with you, and I'm thrilled, by the way, that you're looking beyond your current work. There's a lot of work to be done. There's two things that strike me. One, you haven't mentioned in all of the things that need to be worked on in America, public education. That's a national disgrace. Yes. And it's, a, it's got thorny political consequences to it that we have to push aside if we're going to fix the problem without regard to what those problems are. The second thing is government can't do everything for us. A good example, you mentioned the Veterans Administration. If I took Howard Schultz, Bernie Marcus, Jamie Dimon, and, and Jim Senegal and said, guys, here's the VA, fix it. I will bet you in 18 months, you all have us well on the way to doing as a nation what we should be doing for these people that served us so well and so bravely. So I'm excited about somebody like you giving the thought of coming into public service. I think it's going to be good for the country, Howard, and you'll be great at it. And I urge you to do it. 
Well, Ken, but we, we have to understand well, Ken, thank you. government I, can't do yeah. everything. I, I completely agree with you. And I, I think what we're, what we're really talking about is leadership, authentic yes. leadership. I think the country is lo longing for truth, uh, longing for uh, an opportunity in which is respect and dignity in how we are talking with one another. We're all in this together. Uh, and I got, we have to ask ourselves a very important question today, and is what kind of country do we want to live in? And we can't, we can't live in a country in which we're divided. We have to love our fellow countrymen, and we have to create the kind of leadership in which we are creating value and opportunity for everyone. We can't do that without reforming and transforming the education system in America. Could not agree with you more. Howard, maybe Two um, final questions. For, oh, one last thing. Okay. I believe the glass is half full. I think we are in the greatest nation on earth. We have so much to build on. We have issues. We have problems. But the sooner we address them in a positive way and stop knocking each other and stop demeaning each other, the better we're going to be to get those problems solved. That's a tall order. I don't know how you get there, but that's what needs to be done, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. Can I, can I just, yeah, you know, I said something in our, we had a company-wide meeting yesterday, and at the end I said, uh, you know, I've had the privilege and the honor of, of traveling around the world carrying the Starbucks flag, but I carry the American flag wherever I go, and there's no other country I'd rather come home to when I'm on all of these trips than come home to the United States of America where a kid from Brooklyn in the projects has built and been part mm -hmm. of something that can only happen in this country. You're right. Um, yes. A couple of just political questions outside of your own uh, potential future. When you look at the field, if you will, people say, you know, will Joe Biden run? Or will others run? Are, is there anybody that you get excited about? I think there's a lot of people who might run for president. I, I, I have not focused on that. I, I will say that it concerns me that uh, so many voices within the Democratic Party are going so far to the left. And I ask myself, how are we going to pay for all these things in terms of things like single payer or people espousing the fact that the government is going to give everyone a job? I don't think that's realistic. And I think we've got to get away from all of these falsehoods and start t talking about the truth and not false promises. Right. Um, question, and it really comes from uh, Starbucks investors. I, I saw this on Twitter yesterday. Yeah. If you were to pursue public service, do you worry at all that Starbucks will get wrapped up into it? If you remember when, when, yeah. when, when Romney ran, sure. Bain got wrapped up in it quick. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, you know, it, there is an anomaly here. This hasn't happened very often where if someone like me did do this, the, my connection and association with the company, uh, we'd have to deal with that. But I, we're a long way from that. Um, Joe's got another question. Joe? Yeah, to try to, to focus back on, on just, just the whole philosophy of, of Howard of, of maybe redistribution um, ver versus growth. And, and I'm not sure that the stock market is necessarily the barometer you want to look at either. But it's possible this year we grow above 3%. And there's maybe a lot of reasons why, why that's going to happen. Maybe it was set up by the Obama administration. But for eight years, we didn't. Never had a year. Uh, we barely got to 2%. So there's this never-ending uh, argument about whether growth and letting the private sector have more capital, keeping it in, in the private sector and, and letting that grow the pie, or whether redistribution is the way to go. I mean, if we end up growing at greater than 3% this year, would you repeal the, the Tax Reform Act? Would you raise taxes on corporations back to where they were if, if you were president? Well, I, I don't want to talk in the hypothetical about whether what I would do if I was president, but let, let me try and say this in my own way. Uh, I think the greatest threat domestically to the country is this $21 trillion debt hanging over the cloud of America and future generations. And the fact that interest rates are going up, we're going to be paying close to over $400 billion in interest expense, which, which I think is the, the number one or number two issue in terms of federal expense to the country. The only way we're going to get out of that is we've got to grow the economy, in my view, 4% or greater, and then we have to go after entitlements. And uh, again, this is where political ideology and the political class uh, is not facing the truth and not facing reality. And this is about leadership. This is about getting people together in a room and talking about the fact that the future of the country is on a collision course with time because we must address this. It's not about redistribution. It's about facing these hard truths 
and dealing with significant problems so that we can put the country in a position where it's not about trade wars and it's not about China, it's not about building a wall, uh, it is about getting our house in order but, and doing everything we can, and I, I've said this before, about walking in the shoes of the American people but, and doing what's right for them. But how do you them. get to 4% growth? That, that's, where, that's, the, that's where the rub is, is how, is how you get well, an economy to 4% growth. And, and the best intentions of, of a, of a uh, compassionate, um, well, a, a liberal you can, you, you, sort of, a, I, of I, a philosophy, the best intentions sometimes end up with income inequality getting worse for eight years because the Fed stayed, stayed at no, zero. I, and here we are, we well, may I, get to 4%. I, I think, well, uh, take the liberal piece out of it. I, uh, let's take a centrist approach about getting ideology out. We can get the 4% growth, we can go after entitlements, and we can do the right thing if we have the right people in place who are, bit, who are talking about what it is to be an American as opposed to being a Republican or a Democrat and getting all of these issues out of the way so we can fix the problems of the country. Final question. You spent nearly 40 years um, as running Starbucks. Uh, when I saw you yesterday, it was an emotional day for you. Yeah, We're now a day after. Yeah. So how are you feeling? What, what are you going to go, you know, some people go to Disney World after the Super Bowl <laughs> and they win. What, what are you doing? The truth is I'm going back to work today. You know, I've, I still have a number of things to do at Starbucks. There's a lot, number of people I want to see and talk to. It was very emotional today, yesterday. Um, you know, there was a moment where I started to tear up because I was thinking if only my parents could see this. Uh, it would have been a wonderful moment for me and my family, and, and uh, I, ho I hope they can see it. Okay. Howard Schultz, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you for spending time Andrew, with thank us. Thank you, thank you very for answering, much. answering our questions, and uh, congratulations on a uh, remarkable career at Starbucks, and we wish you the best in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.